WMPG, Gorham, Portland. Hi, Golden Age film fanatics, and welcome to DVD Classics Corner on the Air. My name is Dick Dinman, and our goal is to become your exclusive guide to the very best of the Golden Age classics coming out on DVD. We'll have reviews, breaking news of upcoming releases, plenty of surprise guests, and a special feature devoted to the great Golden Age film composers, which we call Cinemusic. So let's turn on the marquee and lights... Camera, action. Welcome to the second in a series of DVD Classics Corner on the Air shows, saluting iconic director John Ford and 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment's behemoth of a DVD collection, Ford at Fox, which includes 24 classic Ford films, an all-new in-depth documentary, an exclusive coffee table book with never-before-seen photos, and much, much more. Today I'm going to focus on the breathtakingly beautiful musical scores that composer Christopher Caliendo has graced this monumental DVD collection with. In these sad days of emptily bombastic and shrill cookie-cutter motion picture scores, it's indeed comforting to know that there are young composers such as my next guest, Christopher Caliendo who defies the current low standards that exist today by contributing powerful and beautiful film scores to a variety of projects, including last year's groundbreaking restoration of Sam Peckinpah's Major Dundee, for which he composed a terrific new score to replace the original and awful score that was attached to the original release of the film decades before. Well, I'm happy to report that Chris Caliendo is back in force as he was chosen to supervise all of the new music for the five restored silent films in the Ford at Fox collection, as well as composing the scores for The Iron Horse, Four Sons, and the new documentary, Becoming John Ford. Uh, Enough said. I'm delighted to welcome this incredibly talented and even more incredibly modest gentleman back to DVD Classics Corner on the air. Christopher Caliendo, welcome back to DVD Classics Corner on the Air. It, it, it's really terrific having you back. If you remember last time you were here, uh, we were talking about uh, <laughs> this incredible job you did on the restoration of Major Dundee. That's correct. But now, now we've got something even more spectacular to talk about because uh, uh, this new uh, Ford at Fox box set, which has uh, got to be the biggest, the most massive 24 film collection dedicated to one director ever released on DVD. It includes five silent films, two of which you scored, and the rest of which, if I'm correct, you supervised. That's correct, Dick. How long ago was it that you were approached for this <laughs> incredible project? Well, I, I won't forget the day. Uh, I was walking home, and I got a call from uh, Nick Redman, uh, the director, and said, I, I may have a project for you that will take uh, most of the summer. And uh, when, as soon as I got home, I got another call, and I was uh, asked to come to Fox for a meeting uh, with the home video department and director dvd department headed by Richard Ashton. And I was in an interview with uh, six or seven execs, and uh, I think within 30 minutes, I realized uh, I was being asked to score two pictures, uh, musically direct three others, uh, compose the music for the Becoming John Ford documentary, and being given two and a half months to do it. <laughs> In these situations, Dick, you say yes, and you walk out of the room and say how. My, well, you've, you've anticipated my next question. First of all, I've heard... Uh, 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 all of these uh, scores, and they're all marvelous. Uh, Thank you. And so, obviously, you didn't have to make any concessions as far as quality is concerned, but what kind of man hours were you specifically spending to get this thing accomplished? Well, I, I, I'm very almost military about my approach to, to the scoring. Uh, given the budget, 
Um, I, I, I have a, 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 a camaraderie of friends, really, who actually mailed food to my door, <laughs> someone who did the laundry. Uh, my bookkeeper handled all the books for my own publishing company. Yeah. I mean, literally, you delegate immediately a ch- complete change of lifestyle and yeah. your working hours. You know, I always keep a diary, but my working hours were uh, seven days a week, uh, 16 to 18 hours a day of composing. I, I had the chance to see the Iron Horse only once. This was 287 minutes of music in two and a half months. <laughs> We've been talking about uh, this for a few minutes. Let us put on uh, a piece that you recorded for the, uh, the wonderful restoration of the Iron Horse. Let's just listen to a little of it. Thing. This is the second assignment. We, we've spoken about the first assignment where you were given absolutely carte blanche uh, as far as what you wanted to do and how you wanted to do it on the Major Dundee. My understanding is you were given exactly the same carte blanche on, uh, on this project. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. There was no uh, quibbling about an approach, a style. They just said, leave the man alone. And I, I have to say kudos to Fox. Your theme for John Ford, I think, is, is absolutely beautiful. It, yeah, thank you. It, it is so appropriate. To, you know, it, it, it seems to paint a picture of, of the man himself. And I, I keep thinking that if Ford were around today, because he was very appreciative of fine music, he'd be very pleased with the, with the, with the John Ford score that you've done. It, it is absolutely beautiful, but I keep talking about it, and our listener, listening audience is probably saying, can you play a little of it, please? <laughs> so why don't we hear a little bit of, uh, of your wonderful work for the documentary Becoming John Ford.
Let me ask you something, Christopher. I've always been curious. Who, what film composers would you say most influenced uh, you? Who was it who most influenced you when it comes to film music? Uh, I'd have to say, uh, as we define film composer, and I would define that composer as a composer of every form of musical style, theatrical, symphonic, chamber, peasant music, a composer who's gifted at the piano or de dexterous in more than one musical instrument, a conductor and orchestrator of his own works. That in mind, defining that kind of composer that I hearken to, my favorite would be Prokofiev, even as limited as the scores that he produced for film. Um, did, he, did, he, did he not only do maybe two or three scores? This is correct, but I, I think when you ask the question, but perhaps what's my favorite film score, I, I, I have to say for the following reasons that uh, the Alexander Nevsky score for the uh, director Eisenstein, which was commissioned in 37, uh, during a time when Prokofiev actually spent considerable time on the sound stages of Walt Disney Studios. Um, he was offered by, I believe, Vernon Duke's agent a fee of like $2,500 per week to actually stay in Hollywood, which he didn't. He went back to Russia. But huh. this is a true collaboration of composer and director of film music. Eisenstein had confidence that music you know, was an integral and organic part of the film experience. Yeah. And I, th I don't think any composer and director had ever worked so closely before, which are unusual trademarks, certainly for today. Uh, but without question, the score itself, uh, it, it, is, it composes extraordinary imagination encompassing all the trademarks of what I call a great film score, the uh, unique, private, and highly respected collaboration I just spoke of, which hardly happens today, to a score which effortlessly uh, exhibits, uh, composes a joint handling of all the characteristics of great music construction, use of large and small forces, solo vocal arias, male choirs, unique instrumentation, polyphony, uh, his signature identity, which came to, uh, which which come, you come to appreciate, and compose his own style, large melodic leads, yeah. uh, vigorous catchy rhythmic motions. It's his score also that during his time was arranged and performed as a concert piece, as you know, in '39 became for its time the only film score in the standard symphonic repertoire, which is still being performed today, and a score which, for the same amount of time, one month, he was given, he composed, orchestrated, and conducted it himself, as opposed to today when generally a composer works with numerous orchestrators to do that work for him. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, when you, when you consider all those points and, and, and the absolute it's sublime majesty of, of the use of the, orchestra, of, of the orchestra in his hands and choirs, uh, the, the, the evidence that makes this film score great, uh, you begin to realize the enormity of its value and accomplishment. What about the Golden Age composers who <laughs> scored something like 12 or... 13 scores per year, which, which many did, and conducted uh, uh, every, every bit of it. Of those, who do you really like? Alfred Newman, without question, I think he's the, John, the titan of titans. Yeah. Uh, here's a man who stayed in Hollywood, made that much, if not all, of his life contribution in terms of graphite and paper, and in his own lifetime was given an orchestra with his name, uh, composed so many countless Academy Award-winning scores, was often in competition with himself when it came <laughs> to the Academy Awards. That's right. Hugely prolific, uh, influenced Alex North, every, every single composer since that generation. So again, this is uh, this is a gig uh, this is a giant of giants. It's also and interesting uh, that you say influenced Alex North. Uh, Alfred Newman was actually head of the 20th Century Fox Film Department, and brought up a lot of composers. Uh, 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 under him, uh, working on scores for 20th Century Fox. I mean, yeah, that's an excellent point. He uh, he you really—it's an excellent point because it's another trademark of, uh, of of a great musician when you leave behind a legacy of composers you've influenced or taught privately or or, or discovered. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, Henry Mancini. I'm grateful to him for choosing me to work with. It's when there were music departments in the, in the film studios, this was the only way you got into the film business was through the apprentice system. And today you do not have that as a, as a result of the advent of the computer and, of course, uh, many other paradigm shifts that occurred in the business in the last 20 years. I had no idea you, uh, you knew uh, uh, Henry Mancini. 
Well, I was chosen by Henry Man- uh, Henry Mancini was one of the most unusual men. I mean, fan- God, God bless him, but he gave a film scholarship, offered a film scholarship to all the U- USC school systems. Ah. And that's how I got to Los Angeles, uh, to, to UCLA, was I was chosen as his uh, protege uh, out of a handful of, of, of composers. Uh, and the scholarship was a five thousand dollar grant where you had to work with him we we continued our friendship i must tell you i spent i was privileged to spend uh, to have dinner at uh, uh, he likes to be called hank at hank mancini's house <laughs> and we we talked well into the evening because as you know i'm absolutely bonkers about uh, uh, gr- the great film composers and what struck me in addition to the fact that he was such a modest man and s- such so warm and so so nice and apparently without ego what struck me is he was so eager to credit the contributions of uh, of other uh, composers i i found this to be a remarkable man yeah 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 i i learned so many i mean we can go on and on but i learned so many important business points about the music business and even though the business has changed so dramatically the points I learned from, from Henry were so salient in nature that they translated to all the shifts and variations of the musical business yeah. that we've had since he's passed away. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, delighted to hear that because uh, you and I have, uh, have similar tastes <laughs> in many ways. Yes. Thank uh, God. Maybe I should begin composing. I'm getting the... Uh, do you think I should learn how to read music first or... I don't know what to do. I don't know where to begin. You've got to help me. You've got to be, you've got to be my, my Hank Mancini and just bring me up <laughs> from the ranks. Well, we probably should start with peasant music because most of those poor I beg your pardon. were illiterate. <laughs> and they couldn't read or write, so we could start with that. Pe- peasant, huh? Well, I represent that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking in terms of tango and gypsy music, you know, or ethnic music. <laughs> Would you have any advice for young composers who are just just starting out and very interested in scoring film? Oh, again, a long answer because I'd have to be biased to my tradition of scoring, but uh, what, I, what has happened today, let's talk about the results of what's happened today as, as a result of the advent of the computer. Uh, this has tr- greatly, in my opinion, you know, despoiled the, the, the great tradition of film scoring in, in many ways. Uh, the computer... Uh, it, 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 without conservatory training, without a musical education, which I insist upon, you are subject to pressing buttons, creating noises, creating sounds. If, if you, you will agree with me that within the last 20 years, there are very few film scores whose themes, if there are themes, are memorable. Yes. We've, it's this process through which you don't use your musical mind or memory, which are basic fundamentals of music you learn yeah. when you go to a conservatory which are trained in music. In music. And you have the music of the, of the, of the primate. Yeah. So when you go, you hear loudly produced synthetic drums throughout most of the film scores today with no melodies, no themes. This is a result of music being taken out of the schools, kids not being motivated to go to music because today's audience is so educated on the music of the primate, the yeah. drums, the yeah. drum mentality. And now producers who are in their 30s, I mean, most of the execs I work with are in their 30s, 40s, uh, they don't even know what a CD is anymore. Oh. It still amazes me that when a great score comes along, if one sneaks through into the theater for full distribution and you sit there and you are mesmerized by music, how much attention it does grab because music cuts directly to the soul amongst all the arts. And melody is so, so, so vital to human consciousness. Yes. These young execs are greedy execs. It's a very avarice world out there, and you're fighting these huge leviathans. They're very difficult to stop. There's only one Michelangelo. There's only one Da Vinci. There's only one John Williams. There's only one Bernard Herrmann. And you need to study why there's only one of these men. When you listen to Herrmann, when you listen to a confident composer who has immense gifts, they know when and when not to, quote-unquote, turn it on. Psycho would never be psycho. The agony and the ecstasy would never be that. Lust for life would never be that without Miklas Rotsa knowing exactly when right. to turn on the orchestra and making it and truly, again, transporting the audience into what the director is trying to say. You've got to study those examples first, those models, and say, well, you'll see a consistent theme throughout these great, great film composers. They know when to turn it on. They know when to turn it off. In the hands of the great composer who has the confidence to know how to turn it on, it's essential that music does have those moments. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you've said it all, and those that survive uh, have got to be the strongest. They've got to be the most committed to what they feel they need to do, and you're one of them. Talk about being blessed. I mean, I've spent the last few weeks listening to your your scores separately, uh, and and also uh, uh, together with the film, and. Uh, I feel blessed. Sadly to say, Four Sons is not getting the attention of the Iron Horses, and yet that score is my favorite out of all, th all three projects I worked on. Uh, it, 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 I, I knew the challenge is just even mentally trying to come back home and write that score, but there are some homages to Bernard Herman in that score that I loved for oh, the, yes. the, the, yes. the war scenes. Yeah. I don't know if you picked it up, Dick. I but, did, uh, I did. The dance, the Bavarian dance music. The German march when the when the soldiers are are are, are leaving Bavaria and going off to war. There's some stuff there that I'm very, very proud of indeed. This is a wonderful achievement. And now I'm going to try something here. This is just an experiment. Um, I want to play something for you. <laughs> Obviously, the audience doesn't know, but I'm congratulating you. Yeah. I'll turn I'll turn Mendelssohn down a little bit. <laughs> I'm uh, congratulating you because you are uh, about to be a bridegroom. That's correct. And I do want to suggest, if you'll take my creative uh, uh, musical suggestion, that 
instead of playing this Mendelssohn when the bride comes down the aisle, why don't you start, you know, just picture this. Uh, the, the bride hasn't appeared yet, and suddenly she appears. And then, da-da, da-da. From Major Dundee, what do you think? <laughs> Come on! I think, I think my particular audience there in the church will love it. <laughs> I, uh, well, see that. I'm no, I'll have to tell you. Normally, I charge for for this type of. Uh... <laughs> I think they'd rather hear the Sea Troop, you know, <laughs> mar <laughs> march rather than the Sam Peckinpah's main title theme. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> As always, CC, it's a pleasure. Uh, I love talking to you. You've been consistently one of our, our most wonderful and gracious guests. I wish you the best on your your upcoming nuptials, and uh, uh, you should follow my suggestion, of, obviously, of um, of using the theme from Major Dundee as the bride enters. I, I'm very. Mu I'm going to be watching. You know, uh, watching that. If you, if we'll you, have to give you an invitation because by by May you should be familiar with at least the bagpipes as your beginning musical training, and I you can come I, to the church and play. I wouldn't count on it, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I'll be able to hum a little bit by then. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank Sounds you, good. thank you so much, uh, Christopher. The best of luck. Uh, thank you for for gracing our our lives with such wonderful scores and. Keep it up. I'm, I'm waiting for your next work. Yeah, well, my, my, again, my deepest gratitude to you, Dick, for being those, uh, one of the few uh, advocates there who, who recognize the value of, of tradition. Absolutely. And uh, we will talk soon. Okay. My deepest pleasure. Thanks again. My third and final salute to John Ford and the Ford at Fox collection commences next week with two talented gentlemen who contributed so much to making the Ford at Fox collection the masterwork that it is. Award-winning writer-producer-director Nick Redman and Richard Ashton, executive in charge of the 20th Century Fox Classics Division. Please join me. Well, that's our show for today. DVD Classics Corner on the Air is conceived, written, produced, and directed by me, Double D. Now I think I'll, uh, I'll take a casual stroll to my website, www.dvdclassicscorner.net, and read some of those great reviews. And uh, if you twist my arm, I may even write a few. So until next week on WMPG, keep happy... Keep healthy and keep listening.